In our last video, we started the process of writing some code to visualize our sorts. In this video, we want to continue working on that code. So we had set up a little GUI. We can run this so we can see what the GUI looks like again. And we had written this method called render values, which should draw to a graphics context. The, it'll draw lines for every one of the values that we're sorting, and it will draw a single line that's kind of an indicator in there. This doesn't happen yet though, it's supposed to happen when we click those buttons. We're missing two things. One is that the sorts don't actually call render values yet. In order to make that happen, we're going to have to pass in the graphics context because when we call render values, we have to have a graphics context. So that's one thing that we have to do and we'll go ahead and do that for all three of these. The other thing that we have to do is we have to call render values. So it's tempting to say we're going to do render values, pass in A, pass in the J value, pass in GC. But in order to make this work, we need to do two extra things. So when we deal with the GUIs and graphics, one of the significant aspects is that there is a single thread that does everything. It handles the events, it does the drawing, and it turns out that if we do our sorting in that thread, we have problems. But all the drawing needs to happen in that thread. This is drawing to the graphics context. So to make it happy, we need to make sure that it happens back in that other thread. To do that, we're going to put in a call to platform.runLater. So platform happens to be in the ScalaFX application package. And it has a method called runLater, which you give it code. And it happens the next time that the, uh, that the ScalaFX processing has time to do it. The other thing that we need to do is make it so that our sort doesn't fly too fast. So we need to slow it down a little bit. And we're just going to call thread.sleep for that. That just makes it so that the current processing is going to pause for a little bit. We pass it a time in milliseconds. Now, once again, I don't want to have a bunch of magic numbers in here. I'd like to be able to change this easily. So we're going to declare another constant called delay. And I'm going to set delay to be 5 to start with. We'll see how well that works. So then these two lines should go in our other sorts, and they need to go inside of the innermost loop to, whoop, I actually put these two inside, not just inside the inner loop, but inside the if. We don't want them there. We actually want them inside just the inner loop for the min sort and also for the insertion sort. Okay, so now these sorts will render if we actually call them. So the last thing we have to do is make it so that these buttons will actually call the sorts. This shouldn't be too hard to do. We can make bubble button on action equal an action event. And what's supposed to happen in this action event? Well, I want to call bubble sort. Here again, it's tempting to just say I will do a bubble sort, there are two Bs in that, of our first argument is an array, so I could do array.fill of num numbers and math.random to give us random values between 0 and 1. The second argument is just the graphics context. The problem here is remember that everything that happens inside of this block of code is going to be happening inside of the main processing for ScalaFX, which means that our graphical interface will become unresponsive as long as this is running. And that also means it won't be able to draw any of the things that we're trying to draw. So we kind of need to run it off to the side. And that is why I have these other two imports here. We're going to use something called a future from Scala Concurrent. And it turns out the second import is needed so that we can use the future. It's not a hard thing to do. 
all we're going to do is say we want to run this code inside of a future. Simple enough. Copy three lines, paste it twice. We want to have the min button run a min sort and the insert button run the insertion sort. Okay. Let's see how close we came there. Seems to be happy. If we click bubble, you can see a bubble sort working here. So each time through, basically it winds up picking up large elements and pushing them back. I think that in some ways the bubble sort gets its name from what happens to the small elements. If you watch these longer lines here, they slowly move forward. They're kind of bubbling up through here. And we wind up building up this set of sorted values at the end. These are the largest values. Because as we talked about, the bubble sort winds up putting the largest value at the end on the first pass, the second largest on the second pass, and it repeats that way. The bubble sort's not all that fast, but you'll notice that as it goes, it has less work to do because this doesn't get pushed quite as far back. The small values are still moving. It's really this one right here that's going to take a long time to walk all the way up to where it belongs inside of this distribution. And we could sit here and watch this. We could theoretically set the delay shorter so that we could kind of see it happen faster. But I'm going to go ahead and stop it so that we can look at a selection sort. Turns out that if I click one of these other buttons, it'll run, but then the two will be competing for, their, for the display which is definitely not what we want to have happen. So let's run it again, and let's see what a selection sort does. Now, a selection sort in some ways is interesting. See that red line is moving across there and nothing changes. And every time it hits the end, one new element gets swapped up here to the front. So whatever the lowest line is disappears, and it's swapped to the front. As with the bubble sort, this is kind of getting a bit faster every time and that it has fewer things to run through as it goes. And you can see you know, that you can almost look and try to figure out which value is the next smallest and it winds up being swapped up here. And so, yeah, we have this nice sorted stuff that's building up at the beginning. That's how the selection sort works. There's not a whole lot of swapping. Most, if, if we didn't have this red line in here, this would be very boring to watch because you wouldn't see anything happening as it's going through looking for the minimum. Okay, that's selection sort. What about insertion sort? We run insertion sort. Insertion sort actually starts off, it looks like it's running remarkably fast because it's building up this sorted array here at the beginning and it's only working on these values. You can watch the red line. One thing to note about it is it doesn't always move back to the beginning. And of course that's the strength of insertion sort. It doesn't have to push everything all the way forward. It only pushes things as far up as they need to go. Once it gets to this line that comes way down here, that will actually, almost there, that will actually have to push all the way forward. And there. Okay. Um, but it builds it up as opposed to the bubble sort and selection sort, which as you watch them seem to start off going slow and then they get faster. The insertion sort seems to start off really fast, but then as you go, it has further and further to, to push things. Now, this application doesn't give you the ability to compare these. It wouldn't be hard to change our program here so we had a single button that would run all three sorts and have the have kind of three different canvases that were the, we render two separately. It wouldn't actually be very hard to write that code. And then you could kind of see, get a speed comparison of them. And what you'd see is that insertion sort on this random data should finish in about half the time of the other two sorts. But hopefully looking at these things and how they work in a larger scale helps you to understand the functioning of bubble sort, selection sort, and insertion sort.